Bibles, turn with me to the book of Zechariah, chapter 1, or you can follow along on the slides. We're going to be talking about my house shall be built. My house shall be built. We do have uh, have it all on the screen, so you don't have to follow along unless you just have a different translation and want to. We're going to look at chapter 1 of Zechariah in light of the present day and what may be happening on the prophetic screen. Uh, I took this title screen from a verse in Zechariah, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies, my house shall be built in it. You could also call this uh, part two of the sermon I did a few weeks ago about the 70th anniversary of Israel coming into the land and how the 70 years was was kind of the prophetic timetable. So we're going to look at Zechariah chapter one. First few verses are not real prophetic, but I wanted to include them. In verse 1 it says, In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord to Zechariah, the son of Berechai, the son of Ido, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say unto them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, says the Lord of hosts. That's kind of a kind of a good statement, isn't it? If we will turn to him, he will turn to us. In verse four, be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? <laughs> I like when God kind of gets cynical with uh, some of these people, don't you? <clears throat> the fathers wouldn't listen, and the prophets prophesied false sayings, and then the Babylonian siege came, and now the 70 years is over, and God is saying through Zechariah, where are they now? Where's those people at now? Where's your prophets at now? Do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I command my servants, the prophets, Did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so he hath dealt with us. And so, I tell you what, the word of God will make a believer out of the scoffers after it comes to pass. There's a lot of people I talk to about the last days and where we're at on the prophetic timetable. And I get a lot of scoffers, but I tell you what, if it comes true, it's kind of hard to scoff the Word of God, isn't it? Amen? When it happens, it's pretty hard. It makes believers. So, here in these first few verses, God says, turn to me, and I will turn to you. And um, when we look at sowing and reaping, um, really... Sowing and reaping is pretty much the lifestyle of a believer. It's the lifestyle of an unbeliever, for that matter. But <clears throat> for a believer, a person backslides, or a person, and I don't know that that's really a biblical word, front slides, or higher ground, right? It's the opposite of backslide. Advances, there you go. It, it, it all comes down... <clears throat> To choices we make on um, a, a daily basis, an hourly basis, even a minute or by second basis, every choice I make is either a good seed or an evil seed. I can choose to watch a Christian program or I can choose to watch a, 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 a R or something worse program and those seeds go into my mind and they go into my heart. And uh, it, it is, uh, it is what, it, what it says it is. You're either advancing or you're backsliding and God says if you'll just turn to me I'll turn to you amen now again I, I wanted to include that but we're really going to get into the prophet at, prophetic aspects of Zechariah chapter 1 um, in case you forgot there is another super blood moon coming this month the month of January 2019 and uh, it is on the 20th and the 21st The night of the 20th, it'll be visible um, the wee hours of the morning of the 21st as well. And um, 
in case you forgot what a blood moon is, a blood moon is an omen um, that something bad is going to happen. And typically the blood moons apply to Israel, although I wouldn't necessarily say 100%. Um, just as a reminder of the blood moons, in case you forgot, there was also a super blood moon on January 31st last year. Now, I, I think that's kind of unusual because we have blood moons, we have lunar eclipses, but last year and this year, they're both on a supermoon when the moon is at its closest approach to the planet. Celestial bodies orbit in an ecliptical orbit, so you have a perigee and an aphogee, a shorter and a longer distance. And when you have a supermoon, it means it's at its closest point, so it's bigger. Well, it's, it's kind of rare to have a, a supermoon and a blood moon together but we've had it two Januaries in a row. And we know as a Christian that there's no such thing as coincidence in the kingdom of God. So last year on January 31st, this year on the 20th, the 21st, we're having a super blood moon. Just to remind you, back in 2015, Mark Biltz of Shiloh uh, Ministries in Washington State discovered an interesting pattern that emerged in 2014 and 2015. There was a blood moon on Passover and on Tabernacle in 2014 and on Passover and on Tabernacle in 2015. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, other things culminated in September 2015 besides a blood moon. We won't go into that. We've talked about that more than once. And then, of course, the book of Joel tells us I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Can you think of any kind of bomb that creates a pillar of smoke? That would be a nuclear bomb, wouldn't it? With a little mushroom on top. And then he goes on to say, The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. <clears throat> now, Peter quoted this um, at, at uh, his, his sermon on Pentecost, and that was at the great coming of the Lord. And now here we are, 2,000 years later, and it's time for the terrible coming of the Lord. Now, it's terrible for the world. It's good for us, right? Praise the Lord. And then, of course, Genesis 1.14, God set the lights in the firmaments of the heaven, divided them from day and night, and he put them there for signs, seasons, days, and years. And so the Jewish um, rabbis tell us that a lunar eclipse is a bad omen for the Jewish people and Israel. And God said he put them there for a sign. They go on to say that a blood moon represents a sword coming. And then the solar eclipse represents a bad omen for the world a sign of wrath coming to the world. I believe that we are on the very edge of something pretty scary. And I'd like to hope that the church will be raptured before uh, any major wars start. But God knows the timing and it's all in his hands. It's not in my hands. It's not in yours. <clears throat> but whatever the Lord chooses to do, we're just going to keep our eyes on him, aren't we? I'm not going to keep my eyes on the web, on the news. I'm not going to keep my eyes on 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 uh, CNN or Fox News. I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord, and He will see me through. Revelation chapter six. John writing, he said he saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and he heard as it was a, a noise and thunder. And one of the four beasts said, "Come and see." And he saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on had a bow. And a crown was given him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he opened the second seal, he said, I heard a second beast say, Come and see. And there went another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat on it to take peace from the earth, that he should kill one another. It was given him a great sword. So we're told by the Jewish rabbis that a blood moon represents a sword. And we're, we're, we're told here that the red horse was given a great sword. And I always just like to pull words together and let, let that um, come where they may. So 
it could be that a blood moon also which represents a sword coming and the red horse represents war and a sword, great sword could tie together. Which brings us to verse 7 of Zechariah chapter 1. It was on the 4 and 20th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Sabbat, or as it's called today, Shabbat. In the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord to Zechariah, the son of Berechai, the son of Ida, the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were there were red horses speckled and white. And then said I, O Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked to me said to me, I will show you the what these be. Now, I love sometimes to look at Scripture slowly because if I look at Scriptures too quick, I'll read it and say, well, I wonder what that is. Or I wonder what that represents. But when you read the Scriptures slowly and prayerfully, the Lord will usually tell you what these things mean, these symbols. And here the angel says, I- I'm going to show you uh, what this red horse and these other horse mean. <coughs> And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. Now remember we're told that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. So you could say that these are representatives of the eyes of the Lord. In other words, they're traveling around the globe of the earth and they're looking for something or or going to report back to the Lord something and they answer and the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees said we have walked to and fro through the earth and behold all the earth sits still and is at rest now I find this really exciting and stimulating since we know that the red horse is is going to take peace from the earth amen and these all ride around to report that all the earth is at rest. So in the text with the red horse, he has the power to take peace from the earth. And he's commenting that all the earth is at rest. So in other words, all the earth is at peace. There's no major wars going on at this time. You might say, well, that can't be now. Don't we have major wars going on? No, we really don't. We have the ISIS stuff over in Syria, and even that has calmed down. The Trump saying he's going to pull the troops out. That ISIS is pretty much defeated. Everybody's pretty much in their roles. Israel did go in to Syria and bomb some more Iranian targets last night. But uh, beyond that, really, there is no major wars going on. And so this ride to and fro throughout the earth seems to be a preparatory ride to make a statement about how things are now to make way for how they will be on the red horse's next ride. He, he, he's setting the stage. It's at peace now. And then in verse 12, the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you had indignation these three score and ten years? Now, keep in mind that the book of Zechariah kind of goes with Haggai. It's all about the time of the Ezra post, um, post-Babylonian post captivity. They're back in Jerusalem, and yet Jerusalem is a waste. Um, they're they're, they're going to build the temple. They, at this point, I think they probably built the wall, and they may have the foundation laid, but it's still pretty much rubble. And the angel of the Lord is asking the Lord, how long will he not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the city of Judah against which he had indignation these 70 years. You know, it was, though Babylon destroyed him, it was God's indignation against backslidden Israel that allowed it to happen. It was God that did it, amen? And and it was God's indignation against the people who had backslidden against him. And so he's asking a legitimate question. uh, How long are you going to let Jerusalem lay waste? How long are you not going to, uh, you know, do your thing. So again, 
Babylon in captivity 70 years. Now, the interesting thing about Bible prophecy, and you see this all through the Old Testament, is that there will be an event, God will bring a prophet to speak about the event, but the event is a micro version of a future event. Okay? So it's a, it's a, you know, just like there's two atoms. The first atom failed, the second atom is Jesus, right? But there is this micro event, and then there is a macro event. There is an event that happened that will parallel a future event down the road. And that's what we're looking at here in chapter 1. And I'm going to show you emphatically that this chapter has a dual purpose in the micro event of the post 70 years and in the macro event of today. And when you see this, it will blow you away. And so, just to remind you, the 70 years of Israel's captivity is, is now over. And, and we talked about, like I said, this is kind of a part two because we also have that interesting 70 year anniversary with Israel as a nation from 1948 to 19 or to 2018 and as I pointed out in the 70 year message a few weeks ago 71 won't technically click around till May of this coming year so we're still in the 70th year all right now remember the final seven years is made up of two 1260 day periods which is a total of 2520 days is what we would call the seven years right and then there's that interesting story of Ezekiel who laid on one side and laid on another for a total of 430 days. And it was Chuck Misler's study of, I think it was Sir Robert Anderson's writings that discovered that um, if you take the 70 years of Babylonian captivity, you're left with 360. And then that interesting verse in Leviticus that says that if they wouldn't hearken to him, that he would punish them seven times more. And so you get, again, that magic number 2520, but this is about years, not days. And so, um, again, in, in Chuck Misler's uh, studies, you have this chart where he shows us that the first Babylonian siege was the servitude of the nation. And, and then at the end, you take the 2520 years, and it falls on the day of May 14th, 1948. And then the third one, when they destroyed Jerusalem, and you go 2520, it falls on June 7th, 1967. And so that, and we've, we've done this before, so I'm going through this quickly. So Ezekiel's 2520 years did prophetically point to current day. Amen? Now, I wasn't born in 1948, but I was around in 67. And this is events in our or our parents' lifetime which is pretty significant if you ask me so the question the angel asked how long will you not have mercy on jerusalem is as timely right now as it was when it was written in the book of zechariah chapter one in fact the question is more legitimate today than it was then in fact the question is more relevant today than it was then because today we have enemies all around israel we have Iran in Syria trying to build up missile, enough missiles to destroy Israel and, and Israel flying in just last night and taking out a weapons cache. And we have all of this going on. And so this, this question by the angel is more relevant today and is exactly at the right time to ask it today as it was in, in, in that day. How long, Lord, will you not have mercy on Jerusalem? So let's let's just go back to the red horse and then we'll we'll look at that question again. It was the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month of Shabbat or Shabbat, and Shabbat twenty four just happens to fall on January thirty first of this year. Now I don't find that a coincidence. In fact, I love that. I think that's pretty cool. It was exactly one year from last year's blood moon. That, that this date in Zechariah chapter 1. Remember, nothing is in there by coincidence. Nothing is in there by coincidence. So the 24th day of Shabbat 
is January 31st of this year. So last year on January 31st, we had a super blood moon. This year, we have a basically a 10-day countdown to January 31st from a blood moon again. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I'm not making any predictions, but I am watching. Amen. And so now back to the question, how long, Lord? Remember I said micro, macro, right? So then it was post 70 years when the angel said how long. Now it's 25, 20 plus 70 years. And the question is irrelevant today as it was then. How long, Lord? And the date in Zechariah 1 is January 31st of this year. Right? That's pretty interesting, isn't it? And so the Lord answers the angel that talked with him. And it said, he talked with me good words and comforting words. I love that. I'd like to publish that in all of Israel. I have some good news for you. It may look bleak. The United States is pulling out. The Kurds look like they're left alone. Iran's got a, a, a full highway all the way from Iran to Syria to bring in missiles to destroy Israel. And the question is, Lord, how long are you going to let this stuff go on? And the Lord says, ah, don't worry about it. It's going to be all right. I'm still in control. I've got it all planned. Praise the Lord. So the angel that communed with me said to me, cry out, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward my affliction. Can I go ahead and paraphrase that in case you don't get it? So the Lord says to him, Man, I love Jerusalem. I love Zion. That's my city. And I'm, I'm kind of ticked off at all these nations around. I was mad at him a little bit, but the things that are going on today really have ticked me off. That's what he's saying. And so when we look at the current events going on in the Middle East, and we look at Iran, and we look at Russia, who put the S-300 anti-aircraft missiles to keep Israel from flying in, which incidentally didn't stop them. They got in again last night. I tell you what, God is in control, isn't he? He is in control. Now, that brings us to that verse from 16 that I had on the first screen. Therefore, says the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies, and my house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts. And a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Children, God said this, not me, and God's going to do it. And I believe if the Lord doesn't take us out, we're about to witness some amazing events take place in the coming months. I said last time we talked about the 70 years, it seems highly likely that something major is going to happen before May. And now we've got an actual date in Zechariah chapter 1 that's pointing to January 31st. And God is saying, I am going to return to Jerusalem with mercies and my house shall be built. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, yet, Cry out, yet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall be yet spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. So all this talk about Jerusalem going back to the Palestinians, and we're an occupied state. You know what? They didn't ask God His opinion, did they? Now, this is the part where I said I can prove that Zechariah chapter 1 is written more for today than it was for the micro version of it. Then I lifted up my eyes and I saw and behold four horns. Four horns. Now if you're a prophecy buff, you should immediately know who these four horns are. Remember when Daniel in captivity interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he saw head of gold, 
brass, uh, bronze, and iron, right? Or, or silver, brass, and iron, right? And then later on, he saw a beast with these horns, right? So we know who these are, right? These are the four horns which represent the four kingdoms that rose over Israel in history. Babylon first, followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the Grecian Empire, followed by the Roman Empire. And the angel that talked with me said, What be these? And he answered, These are the horns which have scattered, past tense, Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Well, guess what? When this was written, the Medo-Persian Empire has barely risen over it after the Babylonian Empire. Greece and Rome hadn't even came yet. And so God is speaking in past tense about a future tense in the context of the text. That proves that this passage is more emphasizing today's headlines than the ancient events that it was written for. The four horns. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. I found this picture on the internet. I find it pretty interesting. Look what they're doing to those horns. They are, they are putting some whoop on them, aren't they? And, and I said, what do these come to do? And he spoke to me saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah, to scatter them. Now, when you talk about Babylon, we're talking about Iraq. Persia, we're talking about Iran. Greece, northeast, right? Somewhere up in there. And then, and then, Rome. And God is saying to our generation that I'm still in charge of Jerusalem and I'm going to send these carpenters, if you will, and they are going to come to, the, to fray these four nations and to cast out the horns of the Gentiles. So, Iraq, Iran, none of these people are going to have a say-so in God's holy city. They are come to fray them. Praise the Lord. My house shall be built. How exciting it is to be a Christian. And to read Zechariah chapter 1 and know that we are about to witness some of the most amazing prophetic events that the Bible has spoken of for thousands of years right before our very eye. Here we are. It's 1159. It's almost midnight. In January 2017, the doomsday clock was advanced two and a half minutes to midnight. However, that's the clock the world watches. But we're watching a different clock. Amen? You see, Israel is our clock. The nation of Israel is the hour hand. Jerusalem is the minute hand. And the temple mount is the second hand. And if you want to know what time it is on God's clock, we watch the nation Israel. We watch Jerusalem. And we watch the Temple Mount. Just this last week, a Jewish rabbi through studies says that he discovered that the Temple Mount was not where the Dome of the Rock was, but it was a little bit over. Now, I don't remember his exact words, but that's what he said. And of course... I've always believed from the book of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation chapter 11 that they would be built side by side. I think there'll be a wall between them unlike this picture. But God said it, my house shall be built. And I believe we are about to witness it. Jesus is coming soon. Come on up, Miss Nola. Hallelujah.
Jesus is coming soon. I said, Yahshua, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the first and the last, the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, our Savior, our King, the King, Jesus, is coming soon. If the Temple Mount is the second hand, as I said, and we see people like this Jewish rabbi who makes statements like that, that second hand just moved a little bit closer. That minute hand moved just a little bit closer. It's almost time for the church to go home. Let's put the trumpet to our mouth. Let's tell the world, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus saves and His blood washes whiter than snow. Let's pray. Father, we praise You and we thank You today. We thank You today. And Lord, even though I know I'm preaching to all the Christians, there may be someone who listens to this on the internet. And so we just want to take a minute to remind whoever may be listening the ABCs of salvation. That if I acknowledge I'm a sinner, the Bible says all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's the first step to admit that I cannot save myself, that I am born as a sinner because of the original sin of Adam, that I, I can never be good enough to make it to heaven. I, I believe, Lord, I understand that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that. But then... Your word says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you'll be saved. So the B is you need to believe that Jesus came into the world, lived a sinless life, died on a cruel cross for your sins. His blood can wash away your sins. And He rose the third day, conquering death, hell, and the grave. If you believe that. And then the third part, confess Him. You confess Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. Tell someone that you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Don't be ashamed of Him. If you confess Him before men, He'll confess you before the Father. Then according to His Word, you're washed, you're cleansed, you're saved. And if you listen to this and maybe you're discouraged, or maybe someone in the church is discouraged, maybe you, you're feeling depressed or downtrodden hold on the king is coming our time in this fallen world full of sin and debauchery is almost over the moment in the twinkling of an eye the dead in Christ will rise first and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord and, and we won't have to come back in this state anymore we'll always be with the Lord we'll have new bodies new hearts, new minds. We will come back and rule reign with Him for a thousand years. So Lord, in closing, we thank You today for Your Word, the precious promises of Your Word that lets us know where we're at on Your eternal timetable and how close Your coming's at hand. We hear You knocking on the hearts of men. Lord, help us to do our part to tell them that Jesus saves. We we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, let the Son of God enfold you in the spirit of His love. Let Him fill your life and satisfy your soul. Let him have the things that hold you and the spirit like a dove will descend.